I've got sort of two sciencey slides before we get into the fun stuff. And I think it's important to understand, first of all, um, the model or like the way that the process of sleep, and this is called the two process model. And there's essentially two things that go on to cause us to have this drive to sleep, which happens, you know, peak, you know, nine, 10 peak of sleepiness. Um, so what happens is there's a homeostatic drive and there's a circadian drive. So the homeostatic drive is just how long you've been awake for. So the longer you've been awake for, the more drive to sleep you have. Um, and that's why if we nap here somewhere in the afternoon too long, um, too deep, too late in the day, it decreases that propensity or that drive to sleep. Um, interestingly, what happens when we've been awake for long periods of time, there's a chemical in the brain called adenosine and it builds up. And it's, um, uh, you know, you get to the end of the day and your adenosine builds up and builds up and you get sleepy. Uh, but if you have a nap, like I was saying, that can clear out some of the adenosine. The other thing, um, anyone who knows anything about caffeine knows that it acts on adenosine receptors, which is why it makes us feel awake, but not for long. So one of the things I always say is people are always trying to hack their sleep. And I'm like, yeah, there's, you know, if you're sleep deprived, the only thing that you can do to fix it is sleep. You know, caffeine might help you for a short period of time, but it doesn't solve the problem. The other thing that happens as, as we um, are awake during the day and, and then as we sleep is we have um, a circadian rhythm um, and that's controlled by our body clock in the brain. So um, what happens is these two um, processes get closer and closer together here. We have a drive to sleep. Uh, we clear everything out of the brain. We get refreshed and then we start the day again. But what I want to talk to you about is there's things we do to mess up this homeostatic drive, like napping and sleep. And there are things we do to mess up our body clock. So you can see this is the brain here. Our eyes are attached um, through nerves to, to, to the brain and light very much messes up our body clock and um, we're pretty good at messing up our body clock with light through phones and computers. So we can mess up our body clock um, by waking up too early, alarm clock use, um, elite athletes, swimmers, rowers, triathletes, getting up really early when you should be sleeping still, um, artificial light at night, as I said, SCN is the suprachiasmatic nucleus, that's our body clock. Um, attached to the eyes um, and so what we do is we get uh, and, and that that suprachiasmatic nucleus that body clock is um, is um, associated or linked to the pineal gland and what's released from the pineal gland melatonin so no surprise that when it's dark we feel sleepy when it's light we don't um, but as humans we're pretty good at messing around with that and um, getting some light in the in the morning, uh, sorry, getting some light at night when we when we shouldn't have it. That's why light is the best way to adjust to jet lag, because um, light and dark tells you when you should be asleep and, and sleep and um, awake. So it can be really really good for that. All a lot of our peripheral clocks, our immune cells run on a peripheral clock on our body clock. So what happens is you know we mess up our body clock. We can have issues with um, our immune system, we can have issues with hormones, we can have all kinds of issues with our metabolism, um, with our brain in particular. So um, we do lots of things that influence this body clock in a negative way. Here he is again, Roger, um, apparently sleeps 12 hours a night. Again, haven't seen any proof, but he's, he's the poster child, right, for everything. Um, so when we look at, I, like, I could literally do three hours on why sleep is important, um, what parts of the body it affects. We're getting such good science on it because, um, you know, sleep is just one of the most important aspects for our well-being. It's super important for the brain, memory, learning, decision-making, reaction time. If you're trying to teach someone something new and they're sleep deprived, really hard. If you want someone to remember what you've just taught them and they're sleep deprived, really hard. Um, so having people nap after they've learnt something, after they've tried to, you've taught them something, um, getting people to make sure that they're, you know, if you've got to do a hard session in the afternoon, like, okay, example is NFL players, right? They watch hours and hours and hours of video a day. 
And these guys are just sleep deprived and then knocking down the coffee to keep them awake. Um, and now I would question how much they take in because they're sleep deprived because they have such early starts because they have to watch so much video. Um, and I understand that it's a very technical game and they need to watch video and they need to learn things. But doing that in a sleep deprived state, whew, not easy. Um, mood. Anxiety, depression, regulating our emotion, really important. We know that stressed and anxious people don't sleep well. Um, we also know if you've got anxiety and depression, you're also less likely to sleep. Um, you're also more prone. Sorry, if you sleep poorly, you're more likely to have increased mood disturbance. So the direction is both ways. Talked about the immune system before. Body says get sick. Let's help you. You need to sleep and recover. Lots of interesting things about metabolism, especially in kids. We're staying up later and later, so we've got more time to eat. Um, but also um, it affects some of these hormones that tell us whether we're hungry or whether we're full um, and maybe um, some evidence now around the gut microbiome. And, of course, when you're talking to um, professional team sport athletes, especially the men, about recovery and why they should sleep, when you start talking about testosterone and the positive effects and, and the release of some of these really important hormones during sleep, um, you kind of get some interest. Now, and I'll, I'm glad you've got the slides, so um, I don't want to go through this into too much detail, but I want to say that we do have some information that if you sleep less or you sleep more, it can affect your performance. So it's not just, you know, I'm coming in as mum telling the young kids that they really need to get some sleep. Um, I'm, I give them some of the performance information. Now, some of the science talks about total sleep deprivation. That's just 24 hours of staying awake. Now, that research is interesting mechanistically, but we don't see that very often in athletes. Like, yes, they might stay awake 24 hours, but not before a major competition, um, typically. What we see more is shorter bouts of sleep restriction where you may be sleeping a few hours less each night. Um, and then there's a little bit of research in sleep extension, not much. Um, but what we know is that acute sleep restriction can have some effects, but not really. It's really where it gets chronic. It's really when you get more than 48 hours whether where you start to see an effect on performance. And sleep extension, you probably can't just increase your sleep by one night and think you're going to improve your performance. Um, yeah, it, it's the chronic. It's where you've got um, a, an increase in, in the numbers of sleep for a reasonable amount of time where you, where you see the, the good stuff happen. Um, so there's evidence that if you sleep less, you perform poorer, and if you sleep more, you perform better. When it comes to why we perform poorer, um, it tends to be related to our perception of effort. So what we tend to see is that, you know, your VO2 and your heart rate doesn't change after a few nights of sleeping bad. What changes is your perception of effort. Everything feels harder. Everything feels worse. Everyone knows what it's like to be horrendously sleep deprived and trying to stay awake and concentrate. Um, so that's where some of the issues lie. But you've got that information there if you want to go through and have a look. We've collected data over the years um, in some of our best athletes. These are team sport athletes, Olympic athletes. And we see that individual sport athletes probably sleep about six and a half hours of sleep a night of sleep and team sport athletes about seven. Team sport athletes sleep probably a little more because we don't wake them up so early. We wake um, individual athletes up like swimmers, rowers and cyclists. In Australia anyway, we wake them up pretty early. Um, so what we see um, is that our athletes probably aren't sleeping as much as they should um, and their quality is often a bit disturbed and um, I'll talk about some reasons why. So if you look at the data, most of our athletes are getting between six and seven hours. You have the odd ones here which are under four and very few getting more than nine hours. And typically that's under four is team sport athletes who struggle to sleep after a game um, or it might be we wake them up really early in the morning because we don't want to pay for an extra night accommodation and maybe that's legitimate because we don't have the money. But instead of sending them the night before um, or the afternoon before, we send them in the morning and um, get them up at 3 a.m. for a, you know, a 6 o'clock flight. So lots of things that can interfere with an athlete's sleep, lots of stuff. Um, I've bolded the top three, um, lack of attention or priority on sleep, Social media, stress and anxiety. I'd say talking to athletes, these are the top three that I see. Um, caffeine also, yes, I do see that. Um, uh, alcohol is not good for sleep, unfortunately. Decreases quality. 
time of competition if you're an athlete that's competing at night or um, sometimes athletes compete um, at different times because of TV scheduling, that can be a problem. Early morning training times just are not good for sleep. You just can't get the duration you need. Intensified training, we often think that, you know, athletes get tired when they train intensely, but often their sleep is more fragmented. Um, it's like a stress response. So we think, oh, they wish sleep like babies because they're grumpy um, and they're, they're tired, but tiredness and sleepiness don't mean the same thing. You can be absolutely bone dead exhausted, but not be sleepy. Um, and so that's why you can get these exhausted athletes that you think are going to sleep well, um, but their sleep can be really quite fragmented in hard training blocks. I'll hear athletes say sometimes to high intensity, you know, really hard high intensity interval session later on in the afternoon or, you know, close to dinner time, struggle to sleep. Of course, if you're sore or injured, that can be problematic. Um, your chronotype. So if you're an early morning person, um, well, more often than not, we see the problems with the late evening people. Um, and you can imagine, you know, we don't see many night owls who are swimmers um, because that's probably their idea of hell, having to get up that early. Um, we see most of our athletes are early morning or neutral types. We see not many night owls, especially in um, team sports. Uh, so, sorry, especially in individual sports. Adolescence, the body clock shifts back in adolescence. So they become more like a night owl. So that's why it's hard to wake them up in the morning. Their drive to sleep is more like two in the morning to 10 in the morning. Um, the body clock shifts back. And the interesting thing, they think that's because they're more susceptible to light. The body clock, as I said, light. Um, and what do we do? Wow, let's give them phones and um, gaming and Fortnite and all kinds of stuff. So adolescence can be, and I think that's where we lose a lot of athletes in adolescence because everything's just, you know, they're not adapting, they're not getting better, they're so exhausted um, because they've got school, they've got training, and it just all doesn't work together because their body clock is just shifted back. And so my advice always for coaches with adolescents, if you can and you've got one session a day, make it an afternoon session, make it after school. They will be not ready to train first thing in the morning um, before school if you've got these young kids who are in adolescent phase and their body clock shifted. Athletes with kids can be problems. Um, one of a team that I've been recently working with, I won't um, name who it is, but a female team sport, uh, team, female team, and um, the number of players who have dogs and cats and pets that sleep in their bed with them. Um, and they're like, oh, yeah, the dog wakes me up. I'm like, yeah, it's probably not a good idea. Not my job to tell them that they can or can't, but just to say that, you know, you're probably, your sleep's getting disturbed by having pets in the bedroom or in, and particularly in the bed. Um, jet lag, of course, when we can travel again um, and just being in a foreign environment. First night effect, sharing rooms. You know, anyone who's been in Olympic Village, sharing two, you know, there's usually two to a room, sometimes three, little single beds, um, you know, lots of athletes, lots of noise, um, not a great environment for getting good sleep. Um, effective early training schedule. So this is um, looking at a range, again, a whole stack of athletes. And we looked at whether the start of the first training session was between five and six in the morning or between six and seven in the morning. And you can see that if they're starting training between five and six in the morning, they're getting less than five hours of sleep. Um, and that's because, you know, not, I, I often think the important thing is not the time that you the athlete has to start training. The important thing is the time that they have to wake up. If they have to travel, if they have to eat, um, you know, there's all kinds of things that an athlete may need to do before they actually get to training. Um, and so if we've got these ridiculous early training times, it's just hard to get the duration, especially if you're training in the evening or you've got study or you've got work, then it can, can become a real problem. Um, you know, we see some differences in, 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 some of the, in some of the teams. And I think, you know, you, there's this perception that, uh, you know, when a lot of teams show off their amazing facilities and so I think people go, oh, how, you know, that's why that team's so good. It's like the players aren't in there. They might sit in a spa or they might sit in a, in a sauna, um, but it's certainly not recovery the way that we would think of, um, of recovery. And back to this sort of behaviour change bit, we, um, one of my previous um, PhD students, John Paul Kaya, he was integrated in with the Brisbane Broncos, so he did a lot of sleep work with them. And um, 
did this cool study where did monitoring and education on, on sleep for two weeks um, and their sleep at the end, they were better. They, they were getting more sleep and they were doing all the right things. Checked again a month later and they were back to where they started. And this is where I talk about consistent and persistent messaging. Um, and one of there's a few sort of rules of behaviour change and one of them is you can't appeal to people's common sense. Um, education, it helps, but it's not going to make all the difference. We need to think about their environment. We need to think about how we make things stick, how we make our messages stick and how we repeat our information to, to make this um, make things happen. And I'm sure plenty of you have um, read this book, Nudge, and Richard Thaler gets some criticism for some of his, his you know, thoughts around um, behaviour change. But as a general book in terms of learning, for, for me, learning about behaviour change as a first book, it was, it was a pretty good one because I, I remember, and this is probably one of my biggest myths, is when I first started, I did my undergraduate and spent a bit of time working with chronic fatigue syndrome because I was fascinated by fatigue. And then I found that a challenge. Um, and then when I started working with athletes and got to the got to the AIS, I was like, you know, as a naive 20-something-year-old, I was like, oh, how exciting. I can't believe I get to work with athletes who are just going to be so motivated and do just tick every box and do everything that we want them to do. Um, you know, you learn over time that that is not the case. And I think people still think that. I still think, and obviously there are athletes that I've, you know, had the pleasure of working with who just tick every box and they are disciplined and they do everything. Um, but there's plenty out there um, that don't. Um, and so for me, learning about um, sleep and going, okay, now I know how to fix it. So you're like, yeah, I know how to fix it, but I can't get people to do it. Um, and it's like everything, you know, we're well educated about exercise and we're well educated about diet. And I think the stats are, we are continuing, not just Australia, but every other country to, uh, not every other country, but many countries um, to be more overweight than ever before. So we know we've got the education, we've got the knowledge, but putting things into practice um, and actually making change is hard. Um, so I started reading Nudge. Richard Thaler's the guy, he's in um, The Big Short um, with Len Gomez. He actually won a uh, Nobel Prize two years ago, 2018. Um as his, his area is economics. So he uses behaviour change and, and he looks at um, economics. He worked very closely with um, Barack Obama um, to try and look at um, behaviour change. So, you know, he's like, he's pretty smart. And he was, in his book, this is the classic, this is when people say, how do you, you know, create change your environment to get people to make change? Um, this is the example in his book and I love it. So this is apparently the urinal men's in a men's toilet in Amsterdam in Schiphol airport um, and apparently by putting the fly decal in there um, people tended to aim at the fly and it decreased um, their requirements for cleaning by over 80 percent um, so that's what we call nudging um, changing the environment putting things in place to change the environment it's like when you go to the shops and all the lollies are standing there at the aisle that their environment has been set up to make you make choices um, and probably choices that we shouldn't be making in some instances um, so how so this sort of got me thinking I'm like okay well what can we do from a recovery and sleep world to um, change the environment to change the way uh, that we do things um, and again, this is one of the quotes from the book. It says, customers are busy, lazy, often confused. They are surprisingly likely to take whatever option is made the default. Um, and I change that to athletes. Often busy, lazy, confused, and they're just going to take the easy option or the simplest option. Um, and so when you look at nudging, it's about incentives. So how do we incentivize things? And it doesn't have to be monetary, obviously. And um, what are incentives for doing the right thing? Um, understanding um, mappings and that's that's to do with um, you know the environment and certain things which I'll, I'll get on to defaults we're so like uh, the, the example in the book again is if you get a seed you get a new piece of software that you have to put on your computer and says would you like to do this manually or would you like the default we just click default like I know I do um, because I think I'm less likely to get it wrong we need to give feedback when we're doing as what sleep reports 
We need to give feedback. We also need to expect error. We can't expect that when we want people to change something that they'll do it immediately um, and that they'll get it right. And we need to help them make complex choices um, because that can be problematic. So that's essentially what, um, what nudges are. So, you know, can we nudge in sport? And I got me thinking about, you know, sleep and recovery and getting, because, you know, and like I said, people have all the equipment, people have the knowledge, people, like how do we get them to do things? Um, so, again, we're profoundly influenced by social norms. Um, humans are the best nudges of other humans. So when you're working with athletes, you know, having a leadership team or having someone, that, you know, as an example, um, to be a nudger of other people. Um, some of the um, one team that I um, did some work with, they had the, uh, the lead, I basically instructed the leadership team, um, but they did, two of the key leadership players did the sleep education. Um, and they came across way better than me doing it um, because pe the players actually listened and they were really good examples of doing the right things. Um, can we establish defaults and harness inertia? So people are more likely to do what they've always done. And if there's some good things in there, how do we harness that? And how do we get people to make good their default? What incentives? Um, thinking people don't think about the long-term benefit. They think about the immediate cost. How do we get athletes to think about a 10-year career versus, oh, I get to party and I get to have a good time. I'm going to watch Netflix tonight. Um, and humans are generally loss averse. Um, so, you know, and the exa an example I often use is people are excited to, you know, to make it select a be selected on a team but in comparison, they're much less happy when they're not selected. So we're loss averse. We don't want to lose. Um, and so creating competition can be good. Um, so how do we set up our environment? And a really good example that I like around sleep is the, the bedtime alarm. Like we've, we have a set up a morning alarm. Um, but how about setting a bedtime alarm so that if we're on Netflix or we're on whatever, we get an alert to say it's time to go to bed. Um, and it also makes you think, okay, if I need to get up at seven because I'm a swimmer and I want to get eight hours, I need to be in bed by, I need to be asleep by 11. Not in bed, I need to be asleep by 11. Um, so it helps you do those simple calculations. And it's funny because I'd often, I stopped asking athletes how many hours of sleep they get. I asked them what time they go to bed and what time they wake up. One, it gives you routine, but also, you know, it's easy to say eight hours it's harder to calculate and go, oh, yeah, I went to bed at 10 and, yeah, I woke up, yeah. Because sometimes if they say they've slept eight hours and you know they definitely haven't. So bed and wake time, much better than just asking duration. And then how do we educate? When I've, um, what I think is effective is to have simple information in places that cannot be ignored. If you're in the gym, you've got TV screens with a couple of simple dot points on sleep um, near the stationary bikes, um, you know, putting having education in places that people are going to be able to see and um, and not ignore, and the language that we use. Um, so get how, get people often say, um, you know, sleep is really important, and it is. But what about get more sleep? using the word more because everyone can get more. Um, sleep loss can reduce performance. This is this loss averse thing. So, um, you know, it, we don't want to reduce our performance. And there's things, you know, behaviour change wheels that, are, that, you know, can be interesting. So priorities, what are the athletes? I talked about that. What is their motivation to be the best that they can be? Is the motivation to win Olympic gold medal? Is the motivation to just, I just want to be picked on the team and I want the tracksuit. Um, what excuses do you make, do the, does the athlete make? Oh, you know, I just could not possibly go to bed before 10.30 because I'm just not tired. Oh, you fall asleep in zero minutes. When your head hits the pillow, you could fall asleep, trust me. Um, but they make excuses and often it's good to ask other people what they see. Learn. So the thing is we can tell an athlete that they need to, okay, so you need to meditate. Just say that's an example. But can they? Do they know how? Do they, like, that's not good enough on its own. We need to give them the strategies. Okay, here's an app. This is what you do. I need you to do it 20 minutes a day. Ideally do it before sleep, but if you can't, put it in at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Like, we've got to give them um, some structure and some guidelines on how to do things. And um, so there's some the thing that I 
again, uh, one of the little myth busters for me around when I first started working in sleep, I couldn't believe some of the questions I was getting. Um, oh, I wake up five times during the night. Is that normal? Um, I, you know, I, I nap for, you know, three hours starting at six o'clock in the afternoon. Is that okay? And things that we think are no brainers um, or really straightforward um, may not be for other people. Um, and so I think it's important that we appreciate that. And for me, it's about advising small changes. If I go to an athlete and say, right, you need to start doing a recovery five days a week, or you need to go to bed at least an hour and a half earlier every night, you'd be like, no, you've lost them. It's not going to happen. Whereas if you say tonight, I want you to go to bed 15 minutes early and for this entire week, 15 minutes early than you normally would. I'm like, yeah, that's achievable. They think I can do that. And then when they can do it, they feel a sense of success and they're more likely to continue. Acting. So the doing is the hardest bit. So um, providing feedback, expecting them to make mistakes. Um, and then the thing is, so they're starting to go to bed 15 minutes early. Okay, let's move to the next stage. Let's begin a new challenge. Let's, start, let's keep, keep improving. And so I think if you take a bit of a strategic sort of look at trying to get, um, rather than just saying, you need to do this because it's good for you. We need to think about how to move through this process for um, people to actually do it. And the thing that I always found, my first sort of example was I was trying to do sleep. We're working with the swimmers. We were doing sleep monitoring. We we're doing heaps of stuff and couldn't really get any traction or they were into the monitoring, but only just. And, you know, and then Michael Phelps, um, he actually, I think he started working with Under Armour and a, he had a sleep monitor and a mattress or something and, started coming out saying how much, how important sleep is. And then all of a sudden, swimmers were asking me questions about sleep and, oh, what's this sleep monitor and can I wear it? And is it different to the one that I've got? Um, and so sometimes you just need that, that person out there, that person of influence to, to make some changes. 